exciting medley. We appreciate that, and boy, God does indeed continue to shower his blessings upon us, and it does keep getting better and better, and that's not in spite of our trials, but even through the trials and tribulations of life, we have a wonderful and gracious high priest. So glad that you're here. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. Once again, God has graced us with some very special visitors. We're um, glad that each of you are here. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verses 12 through 15 will service us for our scripture reading this morning. I invite you to find that and then stand with me, if you would please, for the reading of God's holy and precious word. Titus chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated for a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the way that you continue to shower your blessings upon us. You're doing so not only uh, individually, but corporately. And we offer to you our deep and abiding thanksgiving. You are so very gracious and merciful to us, and your love continues to be something that we simply can't fully comprehend. 
And of course, the pinnacle display of that is the Lord Jesus Christ coming to this earth and taking our place on Calvary's cross. This is the heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The bad news is we are sinners. The good news is there is a Savior and only one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he and only he, through his death, burial, and resurrection, offers to us the forgiveness of sin, the gift of eternal life in heaven as our eternal home. Thank you, God, for that great love. And Lord, I pray for those who may be with us today or within the sound of this voice who have not yet put personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Thank you beyond salvation for the privilege that we have of living our lives for this one, living our lives out in sacrificial service for this one who loved us and gave himself for us. God, we thank you so much for your word and oh, how we love not only you, but your inscripturated word. And I pray that you once again would find us good students, guided by the Holy Spirit of God, hearts cultivated and ready to receive your truth, so that when we leave here, we do so once again, change, uh, a changed people. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you today. Thank you that our worship funnels down to every aspect of our service, including even now this time of giving. Find us cheerful givers again this hour. And Lord, our heart cry is that you'd be exalted, honored, and glorified. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Marilyn and Bill, for that lovely medley. Focusing on Jesus, in the name of Jesus, which is a good introduction to our last hymn, 650. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world could afford today. Please stand together. Let's sing 650, I'd rather have Jesus. Children dismissed, second verse. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather. My king of a vast domain for me held in sin's dread way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Oh.
Thank you, Audrey. We like that when you sing and play. What a great song. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has given us his promise, and it's clear I will never leave you nor forsake you, but we are here this morning in part to testify that the Lord Jesus Christ proves that virtually every day. The fact of the matter is we wouldn't be here if our testimony wasn't that the Lord Jesus Christ has never forsaken nor failed us. And so because of that, the Lord certainly has the right to anticipate that you and I are going to hang on every one of his words. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for the privilege of opening up the book, the inscripturated word of God, inerrant, infallible, trustworthy. And oh God, may we not forget who it is that is actually doing the speaking. So, Lord, may our hearts, again, as we've noted, be cultivated and ready to receive your truth, and may we demonstrate such cultivation even now. I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Our study in Titus continues this morning. We have come to the final section of this epistle, chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, where the Apostle Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and interestingly so, closes off the epistle by listing a number of people, places, and things, and we certainly are interested in that. We noted last week somewhat broadly that there's a lot of movement in verse 12. But actually not in verse 12 alone, but in each of the remaining verses, it sort of communicates to God's people that you and I ought to be on the move, that you and I ought to be doing things. For in verse 13, we have Zenos and Apollos, and they certainly are on the move. And then in verse 14, Paul calls for good works and fruit, which will certainly keep God's people on the move. And even when you get to verse 15 with its so-called Christian graces, again, God's people are prompted to move. We dubbed such movement as ministry moves, moves that are linked to our ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we were challenged by that. In fact, we asked the question, how many of our movements would qualify as ministry moves. I trust that the Spirit of God will not let us walk away from that challenging and somewhat rhetorical question. We also last week considered the character Artemis, whom Paul alludes to at the beginning of verse 12, you see, and we were glad to identify that even though this is the only place in Scripture where the man is mentioned, and even though all we are given in this section is his name, there is more here than meets the eye and ear. Don't forget the great apostle Paul was about to commission him, about to send him. This morning we have the privilege of considering Tychicus. And in contrast to Artemis, where all we have is his name, there is a narrative. It's limited, but there is a narrative concerning Tychicus. And in fact, if you've been with us and you need to reflect back only on our having studied through um, Paul's second epistle to young pastor Timothy, many of us have already met Tychicus. And of course, that's valuable to us. I'm noting by way of trivia, it's not trivial, but trivia, that his name is mentioned five times, including here in Titus 3 and verse 12. And although we don't have an extended narrative concerning Tychicus, these five snapshots, again, are valuable to us. And when you put the five snapshots together, they testify much of the man. Here, of course, Paul is considering sending him to relieve Titus, who you know is ministering on the island of Crete to a goodly number of churches that are scattered about the island. Paul is considering either to send Artemis or Tychicus to Crete to relieve Titus so that Titus can meet Paul in Nicopolis, as we've noted. And so everything that we said of Artemis, and it was significant, everything we said of Artemis last week is certainly applicable to and, and true of Tychicus. And so we know quite a bit about Tychicus just from Paul referencing him here in Titus chapter 3 and verse 12. But again, we have a number of scriptural snapshots, and what I get a kick out of is although we've already identified that we don't have an extended narrative, and although we're careful with our terminology in saying that what we do have are simply snapshots, which emphasize its um, succinctness, the fact of the matter is, is once you put these five snapshots together, you once again recognize that you can't cover everything in one session, we're going to attempt to do that, and we are not going to have a second session, which means that uh, it's going to warrant your pursuing Tychicus a little bit further in the scriptures that we have 
where his name is mentioned, but I just get a kick out of that, that we have, in a sense, very little said of him. But when you put it all together, uh, we, we really, of necessity, have to pick and choose. I love what Paul says of Tychicus in Colossians 4, 7. So we're turning there. Colossians chapter 4, you're turning back in the New Testament. We're finding Colossians chapter 4. We're going to be reading Verse 7, what a neat text. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 7, here we go. Paul's writing, of course, now to the Christians in Colossae, and he says this, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. So again, it's God talking, ultimately, all my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is, uh, notice, this amazing trilogy of titles that Paul ascribes to Tychicus. Again, revealing. And what tender terms, I probably should read before I keep rambling, right? What tender terms the Apostle Paul uses of Tychicus. I don't mind inserting here my own desire in light of my high regard of the Apostle Paul, and I've not met him face to face. That won't come until I get to glory but we know enough about the great Apostle Paul that we hold him in high regard. And, you know, just this idea that he would reference someone else with these tender and loving and affectionate terms is something to note. You can't help but say, man, I would love for the Apostle Paul to refer to me in that way. Here's what he says of Tychicus. All my state shall Tychicus declare declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. We won't get to verse 8, but I want you to know that here's a place you can come back and pursue Tychicus a little bit further when Paul goes on to write in verse 8, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. By the way, I probably should say something about verse 8 because the word comfort there is parakaleo, to be called alongside of, to comfort. That's Paul's view of Tychicus. And by the way, that's actually one of the names or titles of the Holy Spirit of God. You've heard him referred to as the paraclete. Well, here it is practically true of Tychicus. If you're wondering what the secret of Tychicus' success is, it is that he was a man simply controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. But again, verse 7, these, this, this trilogy of titles. How exciting. Paul refers to Tychicus as a beloved brother, as a faithful minister, and as a fellow servant. There's something here in the original that we do not have in the English that is of that is noteworthy. I love this. It's the definite article. It's present at every turn in Paul's description of Tychicus, including Paul's referencing his actual name. It would sound funny. That's why the translators didn't offer this translation to us. It would sound funny if you had a literal translation because it would go like this. The Tychicus or the Tychicus, the beloved brother of me, the faithful minister, and the fellow servant. The definite article. It's kind of like introducing the president of the United States. This is the president. The only thing is, is that Tychicus is far removed from being the president of the United States. In fact, one of the things impressive about the man is that he clearly is willing to work behind the scenes. He clearly is sporting a servant's heart. And here's the great apostle Paul, who was often in the limelight, looking and holding in high regard a man who often was not. And he says, writing under inspiration of the Spirit of God, this is the Tychicus which communicates a couple things to us. Not only does Paul hold him in high regard, this is the Tychicus, but, it, but 
but Paul's also testifying that, that many other people know and hold in high regard this man. When Paul says this is the Tychicus, the people receiving the letter would say, oh yeah, this is the Tychicus. The thing, again, that's interesting, are you going to follow me this morning? You are alive and well. Everybody reach out their palm, take your two fingers and press it about a half inch away from the outside of your arm and make sure that you have a pulse. Beep, did a beep, did a beep, did a beep, did a beep. Anybody not find their pulse? We would think that what Paul would be promoting is that this is a man who, you, you know, because of his multifold gifts and abilities is Maybe not seeking the limelight, but certainly in it. You know, we would think that uh, Paul would be holding in high regard only charismatic leaders. Only skilled pulpiteers. And yet as we listen and look carefully, we, we hear Christ's words, Christ's very own words ringing in our ears and in our hearts where he says things strange like the first shall be last and where he communicates unequivocally clearly so. That if you want to be honored, it will only be as you're sporting a servant's heart. Where if we read between the lines, Christ would say something like, let me tell you about the greatest of leaders. He's a man, a woman, a young person who's sporting a servant's heart and is willing to work behind the scenes, willing to be sent, to be commissioned, willing to go. And again, like with Artemis, we, so too with Tychemus, will not be impressed with all of their various gifts that are delineated and described here because they're not. We once again are hovering over the clear biblical reality that what impresses God is different than what impresses the world. And even our definition of leader and leadership is distinguished from God's. More about that in just a moment. The ticket. Well, you want to leave your mark? And be like Artemis and be like Tychemus. Be a man, a woman, a young person with a servant's heart. And willing to work in all and any scenarios, including behind the scenes. I want to say a quick word about each of these uh, titles, this trilogy of titles that we have here, and you're going to have to behave yourselves. Pa Paul says, the beloved brother. Paul's claiming him, by the way, and so a literal thing would be, the beloved brother of me and you is the implication. I, I, I don't know. You know that it doesn't take too much to get me excited, but there's something special about hearing the Apostle Paul put his finger on a particular person and say, I love that man. And by the way, I don't want to belabor this, but I think that's applicable to us in a lot of ways, including just this practical observation, and that is, and you're going to think this is self-serving, and it's not. The fact of the matter is you and I just don't tell each other that we love each other enough. Husbands don't tell their wives that they love them enough. Wives don't tell their husbands that they love them enough. Parents don't tell their kids that they love them enough. Kids don't tell their moms and dads that they love them enough. Brothers don't tell brothers. Sisters don't tell sisters. True, even not only biologically, but ecclesiology. Yeah. ecclesiastically. And I even think that's a word. 
Oh. Two things, all that we really loved each other. And two, that we express that with both lip and life. Paul's on eternal record as saying, I love the man. It's interesting, I can, we can picture Tychicus saying, man, do I love and hold in high regard Paul. But this is Paul writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He's not testifying that, he's beloved of, that, that he is beloved of Tychicus, but rather that Tychicus is the one whom he loves. Kind of neat. And of course, as you would expect, this is agape love. This isn't this warm, fuzzy stuff that's floating around, you know, that we gain and lose, gain and lose, gain and lose. This is rock solid stuff. Here's the Apostle Paul. It's as if he stands up, and boy, he's got a platform. It's as if he stands up and he says, this is a man that I, that I will stand with. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? This is a man that I'm going to support to the very end. It's a testimony of Paul's commitment to Tychicus, which is absolutely amazing. He says, the beloved brother of me. And he says, then he says, the faithful minister. And we've known this before, I think I can rehearse it with you very quickly. I, both these words are very significant. For in, uh, both these words are very significant. The, the word faithful we've talked of many times. And the very moment that we hear the word, we plug it into what Christ said in one of his parables at the end when he was dealing with a faithful servant or two where he said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you know that we've often paused and identified because we automatically, th this is a quick word for those of us who, who are marked by presumption, where we automatically think that these are words that we're going to hear. It's amazing to me that we, as God's people, can live our lives often the way that we want to live our lives, not the way that he wants us to live our lives, and yet we still anticipate when life is done that we're going to hear from the Lord Jesus Christ, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And how many times have we said, hey, if you're going to anticipate hearing, if you're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you think that you might better do good? You think that you might better be faithful? You think that you might better be a servant? Please. So it's sad that we've downplayed, which is what, something that is such a significant biblical word and clearly the high calling of God on our lives. And again, what's neat about the term, this is practical Christian life and living. This isn't tied to some kind of gift. This is the gracious work of God in the heart and life of everyone who has put their faith and trust in Christ. He paves the way for us to be faithful. Can you believe it? He strengthens us so that we can be faithful only for us to arrive at the end of our journey and the Lord Jesus Christ with great reward saying to us, thank you all. You did good. You were a faithful servant. But boy, if he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, we better be doing good. We better be faithful. We better be sporting a servant's heart. And then, and then this, I get a kick out of this. And, and stick with me. I, this, I'm possibly going to say some things that if you pluck them out of context, I could get in trouble. Oh, you're interested now, aren't you? The word minister here is the Greek word diakonos. We get our English word deacon. I can talk freely to you about this because I believe this with all of my heart that the men that are serving on our deacon board presently have a good handle on what I'm about to say to you. But I don't know that that would be true in many other places. The word diakonos is a Greek word for a waiter. Kind of like waiting on tables. Hey, how many volunteers? We're looking for an attendant. We're looking for someone to serve.
We look at the deacons, and indeed we should, and we look at the pastoral staff, and we absolutely need to look at that and recognize that, one, it's the high calling of God, and two, it certainly makes up the spiritual leadership of the church. But guess what? We are full circle back to the Lord Jesus Christ definition of a true, genuine, biblical leader. And that is, again, guess what? A man who's sporting a servant's heart. That's the heart of his ministry. Paul says of Tychicus, he was the faithful minister. Awesome. And then he goes deeper with the third title. He says, fellow servant, and not to lay a bunch of other semantical things on you, but it's the, the root is doulos, which is slave. And Paul actually says, he is my co-slave. There again, you know, great popularity. Let's see, who wants to run for the office of slave? Who wants to be waiting on tables with very little tip? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But notice, Paul says co-slave, translated fellow servant in the Lord. We've talked about it before. Grammatically, it's called the locative of sheer. This is where Tychicus lived his life. In the Lord. I.e., in his strength and for his glory. In his strength, for his glory. In his strength, for his glory. In his strength, for his glory. What things, we might ask. All. In the Lord. We don't have time to do this, but if you're looking for like a neat little study that you can do on your own or perhaps even with a small group and you want it to really be biblical, take the phrase in the Lord and pursue it through the New Testament scriptures. What you'll discover is that you don't go far before God is putting his finger on the principle and when you get to the end, you recognize that there isn't anything that makes up the Christian life and living that ought not to be in the Lord. In other words, this really is a sphere within which we ought to live our lives in the Lord's strength and for his glory, in his strength and for his glory. And Tychicus, and of course, Paul chose to live their lives, their lives there. Now, now one other uh, very significant thing about Tychicus we, we know a lot about Tychicus already. We, we, we know that Tychicus, like Artemis, was a man of the gospel. We know that, uh, like Artemis, he was a man of the word. We know that he was a man of uncompromising conviction. We know that he was a man marked by devotion and commitment. We know that he was a skilled and gifted minister. We know that he had a servant's heart. We know that he was willing to work behind the scenes. We, he, we know that he was a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant of the great Apostle Paul. We know that he was a reliever. Paul's about to, oh, do, do the tigers need a reliever? We know that T Tychicus was a reliever. And you won't forget it because of that reference, even though it may cost me my job. He was a reliever. He was... Here, potentially relieving Titus so that Titus, can you see the inner work behind this? Can you see the passion of the men? Man, if I go there, then someone is able to go from there to there, and God will be glorified by that thing. Oh, if I can just get there so that he can go there. Relievers, that kind of thing. And here Paul is potentially sending him to Crete. And then this we know for certain, and again it's based upon our previous study, that near the end of Paul's life, and we could just weep because he's about to be martyred for Christ, and his one heart cry is, oh, that I could see young Pastor Timothy. So what does Paul do? I got to get old of Tychicus. I got to send Tychicus to Ephesus so that he can relieve Timothy, and Timothy can come and see me before I'm martyred for the cause of Christ. Who are you going to entrust that kind of job to? Who's faithful and 
willing. But perhaps the greatest thing about Tychicus was that he was a male man. A letter carrier. He carried three epistles written by Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit of God while Paul was in his first imprisonment in Rome. And he was assigned to carry the epistles to the appropriate churches and people. And the three epistles were Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. We've noted this before. It's obvious, you know, obviously it was essential that the epistles get written, and Paul did that under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, but it's equally essential that the letter written gets to the person to whom it's been written to. Oh, for godly mailmen. Oh, for godly letter carriers. And please know your mind has already gone there that this is much more applicable applicable to us than most of God's people would be willing to admit for we are letter carriers and this is the letter God's written to the world. We are letter carriers and we are to hold forth the word of life according to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. You and I are commanded to hold forth the word of life. By the way, and we're not turning there, but in the previous verse, verse 15, it stated, you shine as lights in the world. And you would ask the question, how? Watch this. The end of verse 15, you haven't turned. You shine as lights in the world. How? By holding forth the word of life. And oh, what words we have there. Don't have the time to do this. The, the, the original language there in Philippians 2.16 talks about the circular truth where it holds you and you are holding it. It's like you look at two people and they are so tightly embraced you really can't tell who's holding who. I was going to do that with Ann, by the way. And I have to tell you, God, Spirit of God, very, very disappointed that you didn't afford me the time to do it. She was going to hold me at, I was going to put my arms like that, and then she was going to wrap her arms around me, and we'd identify, oh, she's holding me. Then she was going to put her arms down, and I was going to wrap my arms around her, and you'd say, oh, he's holding her. Then we were going to be in full embrace, both holding each other. And you say, boy, it's awful hard to tell who's holding who. They're both holding. Object lesson for us in regard to our relationship with the inscripturated word of God. It is holding you. You can tell because it actually pans out in the way in which you live. And you are holding it. You can actually tell because you are testifying with lip and life of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessed gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and the thing that's amazing about that, you'd think that that should be true only of leaders. When in reality, it's normal Christian living. God anticipates that this will be true of you and me, through and through and in every practical way. That the word of God, the word of life is holding you and you are holding forth the word of life. God help us. Bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment. Once again, child of God, you have your commission. I need to say a quick word to those of you that may be here within the sound of our voice that have not yet put your personal faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard us just now reference the Bible as being the word of life. Let me tell you why. 
this book actually saves, and I'll tell you how. It saves by presenting to us the Lord Jesus Christ. It first of all confronts us with our sin, the gravity of it, and the consequences of our sin. It's not a pretty picture, for we all have sinned. And our sin causes us to fall way short of the glory of God. But then it introduces us to the good news. And it points us to the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Only he came, only he lived a perfect life, only he died. The perfect substitutionary sacrifice for sin. Not just of the world, but your sin and mine. And only he, through his death, burial, and resurrection, offers to every man, woman, and young person the forgiveness of sin, the gift of eternal life in heaven as your eternal home. It's yours for the receiving, for John 1.12 said, but as many as receives him, to them gives he the power to become the sons and daughters of God. Would you take advantage of this quiet moment? Would you lift your heart to God? Would you cry out, call upon the name of the Lord, allow God to save you through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive Christ as your personal savior from sin. And as you do that, please let somebody know. Heavenly Father, continue to impress these things upon our hearts. Here's a couple of men that are noted in scripture. Paul lists them here at the end of his epistle to Titus and it would have been very easy for us to read over the names and yet these are men that you intend to greatly impact our lives and I pray that they have and I pray that they will and then God continue to save people I pray this in Jesus name amen He is the light, and we are to be light bearers in this world, faithful servants of the Most High God. Let's stand together, sing 663, 663, verse 4 only. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Brother Ken Way will close us in a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we, we come to the close of our morning worship service desiring that God the Holy Spirit would make the character qualities of Artemis and Ticklemus the qualities that would be reflected in each of our hearts and lives. We just ask that we'll leave this service desiring to walk in a way that would present the word of God and a lifestyle of the same character qualities that we see in these two men. Add your blessing to each of us as we go our separate ways. We just pray that you'll continue to seal to our hearts the truth of your word. And for all that you do, we'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.